is not they trust the internet. It's a series of two, so, 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 we're very glad to have you on tonight, Ben, if I may call you that. Sure. How are things going? It's going well. Greetings from Montana. Yeah, how's the weather out there right now? Are you guys getting a pretty bad winter? I haven't uh, haven't really looked into that too much. No, it's been the mildest winter I've ever seen. Uh, temperatures are like 40 degrees, and it's it's uh, it hasn't been much of a winter. It hasn't we, had, we never had much of a cold snap like we usually get. I wish you guys would send some of that my way. I'm out in Minnesota, and I tell you, we've had uh, uh, we've had some pretty pretty cold. Sub zero. One night it was like twenty, thirty below. So, I wish, <laughs> wish we could find a happy medium somewhere along the way. You know, I was just out in Montana in uh, September, and it was really, really beautiful. I was out uh, by the Rockies, and uh, you know, it was really a place that I could see myself being in the future. Was there anything in particular that kind of drew you out that way? Well, my wife and I lived in Seattle for about twenty years, and we used to come out here on vacation because we liked Flathead, the Flathead Lake area, and Glacier National Park. And now we're now we're here. I can see I can see Flathead Lake outside my window, and uh, we're about a hundred miles south from Glacier National Park. And we like to ski too, and we're great. To, we're close to some great ski areas. Yeah, that uh, that sounds really nice. Now, do you put any uh, stock into the whole? global warming thing well are they calling it global warming or, or climate change and now al gore is calling it calling it the climate crisis you know the climate changes sure and there's the the, the global temperatures fluctuate year to year remember in the middle ages how it, it was an extreme warming trend for centuries and uh, that's when greenland actually had some green on it and there was no you know excessive output of industrial pollution back in the middle ages so it it depends on the sun, and a lot of the a lot of the um, the uh, climate change arguers will leave, conveniently leave out the sun. And now the sun has it, right now it's on the lowest cycle of sunspots. Uh, so you know they're leaving out that out of the equation for one thing. And another thing I don't trust is a lot of the scientists are being bought out by government money, and so they're they're producing they're they're skewing the data to to match uh, what their masters want. And they want the they want a carbon tax. They want a, another tax on the slaves. And they want you know Al Gore has his hand out. He wants his billions because he's invested in all these carbon um, these. Uh, companies like that, which is crony capitalism, it seems. Yeah, and Al Gore. I mean, I can't stand the man. He's just he's an obvious huckster, and he's he's, he's out on promoting this. And uh, what did he like ten years ago? He said. Oh, 10 years from now, the, the, the ice caps will be totally melted, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, they, they aren't. And the sea levels, you know, they might be rising a little or going down a little. I mean, it's hard to tell. But he has a big mansion right there on the coast. He doesn't seem to be afraid of rising sea levels. And he leaves a much bigger carbon footprint than, than the average man ever could. But he's got his hand out and he wants to get paid. And it's another form of tax and globalization to pay, pay tribute to the central bankers. That's what it's about. Now, the climate may or may not be changing. I don't know, but I don't trust the people who are telling me that I have to, we have to shut down um, coal powered plants and shut down our industries and um, start paying more money into this, into the UN to, uh, to uh, further their ends, which is always the same end. It's more power, more money. And that's why I'm very skeptical about the whole thing. And now it's now it's the meme that they have now. If you're skeptical, you're some kind of wacko racist hater, and you need to be silenced or put in jail. Even in some cases, it's gotten it's just gotten ridiculous. Yeah, it's very easy for them to come out and say, "Well, look, he designs our stance on climate change, so he probably also holds this other plethora of unsavory opinions." And, and I, let's just blanket them. And time I go through. It's it's gotten really strange. I mean, I've been I've had some several uh, um, people from the from uh, liberal publications online too who want to interview me, and um, it's it's kind of their questions end up being skewed. They're trying to corral me into this. Well, aren't libertarians all racist? Don't you agree that their their economic philosophy tends to make them racist? And where is this coming from? Just because. What the the Austrian School of Economics and, and people like von Mises disagrees. They disagreed with um, the Keynesians, and, and Keynesianism is taught in all the colleges now. Just because they're at loggerheads, then the Keynesians the, the, and the uh, academicians fight back by saying, "Well, the, the 
course, the, liber- the libertarians, they got to be racist. That's what it's all about because they don't like big government and big government helps the minorities. Therefore, I'm a racist because I'm a libertarian. I mean, come on. That's, that's the kind of logic they're using. And I actually had to answer some questions such as that or, oh, like Ron Paul is a, you know, Ron Paul is a racist. And because, you know, he allowed some some really minor racist quip in, a, in an obscure newsletter that that um, he didn't even write or have anything to do with, but since he had he had an article in, in one of them before or something, um, then somehow it became Ron Paul was supporting this racist statement that appeared perceived racist statement. I don't even remember what it was, but then all of a sudden the um, the reporter is asking me. I find it hard not to be skeptical, and uh, you know I think he's probably racist. Don't you agree? And I said, Well, no, he's of course not. And he had nothing to do with that. And in fact, Ron Paul, back in the back in the mid 70s, um, he was, a, you know, he delivered babies as a doctor. There is an African-American man who was having trouble in Texas because he was married to a white woman. Well, she she needed to give birth and they were having trouble at the hospital. Ron Paul caught wind of that. And guess what? Ron Paul stepped in and delivered the baby. And because what this what this couple, this um, you know biracial couple went through. He paid the tab. He paid the bill. Now, does that sound like a racist to you? I mean, but that's how absurd it's got. They 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 want to dig deep and drill down and find this racist oil that must be down deep in everybody that's not of their political opinion. Anybody who violates their narrative somehow has got to be impugned. It's almost like, um, uh, you know, how um, Catholic fanatics used to back in you know hundreds of years ago used to label people heretics. And once they got labeled a heretic, somehow they're not human anymore. They're not one of us, and they can then we could burn them at the stake. <laughs> it's like witch burning. A lot of these, a lot of these people, these um, social justice warriors and such, that's what they want. They they don't want just you to apologize or feel bad. They want to really just they want to like burn you at the stake. That's what it's about. It's it's and and by that modern terms, that means destroying your reputation. It means destroying your career. It means going after your friends, your family, your your landlord, the whole gamut. And all of that has happened to me. <laughs> Just the language, if you listen to it, denier. Denier isn't any sort of political language. It's very distinctly a religious narrative. And I would love to hear you talk about uh, just the ramifications the far right and the far left seem to be having on your life. Well, you know, I don't, I don't really consider myself left or right. I'm, I'm not for the Republicans. I'm not for the Democrats. Um, I come, I came from a newspaper background, and um, the paper I worked for for many years, the Seattle Post Intelligence, or well, a lot of the reporters there proudly proclaimed it that this is a liberal newspaper, and they're proud of it. And you know, I, I've, I've. I'm still liberal on a great many social issues. I mean, I, I'm not against gays getting married. I mean, who, what business of that is mine? Or the states. If two people love each other, fine. Go ahead and get married. Or the war on drugs, which is completely ridiculous because the government is bringing in the drugs. They're, that's why they went to Afghanistan to protect the poppy fields. And so they bring the product in, and then if somebody has the audacity to use their product and get caught, they get to sent, they get sent to to prisons that are run run by corporations for profit. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's um you know there are a lot of issues that I don't identify on the right or the left. Um, uh, well, let me put it this way: I'm I'm kind of I want to keep an open mind. I want to have the freedom freedom to change my mind too. Well, I, you know I've changed my mind on a lot of things over the years, but I don't I, I don't like getting channeled into this left right rut that and we see what's happening when with with Trump arriving on the scene. And you see what, how the panic that is is coming to the surface in the Republican Party, and, and you're starting yeah. to see who's really running the show behind the curtains. These neocons who want their their they want the status quo, they want their jobs, and even the media pundits. They you know at the um, uh, what's that Republican um, magazine? Um, no review. Review. Yeah, you see them all just. They're coming out on these with these irrational tirades, you know, supposedly intelligent people just writing these tirades against Trump that make that that boil down to nothing but ad hominem, you know, fallacies. That's all it is. But you see these people, the the, the Bushes and the and the and the Karl Rove type people. They're just they're just like losing it. And the more they get angry at Trump, the more I like Trump, even though I disagree with Trump on a lot of things. I'm really enjoying the show, and I and I like to draw cartoons. 
featuring Trump because let's face it, he's a lot of fun to draw and, and he's not, <laughs> he's not afraid of political correctness. And this political correctness has gotten, gotten so way, way out of, out of whack. And it's like, it's take, it's, it's, it's become so pervasive everywhere. It's so refreshing to see somebody who doesn't care that, you know, he's saying he might say the wrong thing. Unlike yeah. say, a Bush, you know, uh, who was who immediately went up there to, to start saying, proclaiming his love for the for the um, for the immigrants, for example. OK, that's fine. You know, I, you know, I, I lived in Texas for 10 years and I, I worked alongside a lot of, of um, Mexican-Americans and they are fine people. But, you know, hey, Mr. Bush, if you really love them that much and you want millions of them to come in, let them camp out on your lawn and, you know, let them. Let him stay at your house and see see what happens, you know. But but yeah. Trump came out and said, you know, do we have a law or don't we? Are we going to have open borders or are we going to have a president who whose duty is it is to enforce the law? And the law say law says we're not supposed to allow millions to come in with no, without any vetting or any ch background checks or anything, and they just like they pour into the country. And you're and mm -hmm. and. And if you even say that you're you're questioning that, oh, you're racist. Oh my gosh, you're a terrible. Well, you, did you see that? Um, it was it. It was just, uh, I believe, about a week ago or so, because you know, right off the bat, with his uh, comments on the illegal immigration and illegal immigration, not immigration of Hispanic people, not immigration of any certain kind of people. It was just the illegal immigration was his main issue that they blew it way out of proportion and you know, totally racist. Uh, you know, slander against him. And, uh, but this, this comment possible. they asked him, yep. this comment that he was uh, asked, I believe it was prior to the New Hampshire uh, primary, if I recall correctly, somebody saying, could you look a Syrian child in the face and say, you know, get out of my country. I don't care if you're starving. And he really handled that. He said, you know, you look at the population of or the percentages of immigrants and how they break down and it's overwhelmingly young men it's not very many young women and children and it's just ridiculous to go on this emotion-based thinking and say you know, we need to forego security we need to forego proper background checks proper ways of going about things to make sure that these people are who they say they are to make sure that they are safe to bring into the country to make sure that they are safe and don't have any criminal ties, any background that could threaten national security. And we need to think about it logically and not just throw the doors open and say, oh, hey, if you're not feeling so good, if you're having a little issue, come on in. You know, it's just. It's common sense. You know, I'm all for legal immigration. And and uh, that's that's what Trump wants. And it's it's common sense. What, what you just said, it's just that's, you know. That gets tossed out the window in the face of political correctness, and, and I've heard political correctness being called um, what was it, uh, fascism um, parading as manners, and that's pretty good. That's what it is. It's like, well, it's it's not good manners to point out the fact that hey, we had a lot of a lot of, the increase in crime, for example, and Trump pointed that out that you know there was um, uh, you know incidences of illegals committing some horrendous crimes and rape. And just because he pointed out a few incidences, he's, oh, well, Trump says all Mexicans are rapists and they're all criminals. I mean, <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, most people are starting to realize that, you know, that that's just all hyperbole and, and political correctness reaching the point of insanity. And they know the facts now, thanks to the Internet. So anybody can get on the Internet and really see what happened and you don't have to have it filtered by the propaganda arms of the mainstream media. So that's, that's what they're losing their grip. And, and the, the more they lose the grip, the more frenetic and angry they become. And they become almost this hysterical, shrill, um, yelling, yelling, um, insults. That's all it is. It's just, they just yell crude insults at him now. You know, and that reminds me speaking of the internet kind of loosening the grip of the mainstream media and their narrative, have you heard lately or recently um, they've been saying something, I've read some things along the lines of the government is actually putting funding into studying Internet memes to try and figure out how to use the, the popularity of Internet memes and kind of hone their meme skills around how to kind of push their own mainstream narrative memes. And I thought I was just... 
I mean, the ludicrousness of this, of that kind of situation that they're funding and putting tax money into studying internet memes for their own gain. Of course, the internet's just laughing about it, but I mean, it is, it just goes to show that they just are so out of touch. They don't know how to really connect when we've got. Well, I, think, well, I don't know. I, the government has always used memes, but they, they've already, they've had like the, um, uh, they had the market cornered on it, so to speak. So they were always using memes to brainwash the public. Now they now their memes are getting um, – <laughs> they have to compete in the free market when the free market of ideas and other memes, and they don't like that. So, I like uh, that. The free market has fixed memes. I like that. Yeah. The big thing I see is just this anger and vitriol uh, after Trump won New Hampshire, which pretty much anybody with a, a decent political background – and uh, who saw the polls so knew it was coming. Huffington Post exploded all across the front page in big red letters. A racist, sexist xenophobe just won the New Hampshire primary. Seriously, New Hampshire? <laughs> well, you know what? I hope they keep going with that with that narrative because that's just going to make more people like Trump. And, and it's destroying their own credibility. I mean, come on. I mean, you can't come up with with something besides hurling hurling this kind of invective. People see right through that. At the same time, I'm actually kind of afraid of empowering Trump more as much as I like him. I've come to a point where, especially after Ch Justice Scalia died, where I'm almost afraid to see what would happen if a Clinton or a Sanders would get in because that's at least two justices that will be serving until the 2050s. They can appoint whoever the hell they want if they have the next four to eight years locked down. And I just don't see how uh, Trump or Ted Cruz is honestly electable yet. Well, it, it, I, I have some thoughts about that, but Trump really clouded the waters. I mean, it, it was pretty clear to me it was going to end up being another Bush and another Clinton. Um, and... <sighs> I, I I don't like either one. I despise both of those families. Maybe Clinton will leave a, a little bit more because the Clintons are are criminal, murdering grifters, and and Bill Clinton's a rapist. There's just no way to refute that. They are. I mean, yet here they are, masquerading as some sort of uh, laudable public figures, and they and and both of them should be in prison. And yet here it is. It's like these these globalist bankers can parade these two corrupt individuals in front of us and play this little game and per let's make believe that these people are somehow virtuous you know let's yeah, let's vote it's, let's vote. And, and it's just it just it just it's in, it, it makes it just incenses me when i when i see them on i can't i can't stand even to look at them or hear or hear hillary's cackles you know i at least bernie sanders i think i mean he is misguided as i think he is i mean he's at least um I, I kind of like him, you know, and at least he's I w you know, he's a little bit more honorable, even though I disagree with him 180 degrees about his socialism. Mm -hmm. He's, he's the, a real person instead of a, a one of these uh, globalist uh, banker puppets. Yeah, last time I checked, he's not flying off to attend uh, Bilderberg meetings. Yeah, yeah and he's one of the few people besides um, Ron Paul to um, actually get on Ben Bernanke's uh, case in Congress when Ben Bernanke used to show up. It just used to be a giant butt kissing fest, and it just that used to make me crazy too. And at least mm -hmm. Ben Bernanke uh, uh, or, uh, or Bernie Sanders got Ben Bernanke a little bit uncomfortable, and he wanted to know where the money was going. Where are these trillions of dollars going? And you know, answer the question. And Ben Bernanke says no. I'm not going to tell you that. And then that sort of reveals who who's really in charge of the country, who really had the power. It wasn't Congress. And if Congress mm -hmm. had had chutzpah, what I would have done if I was Bernie Sanders, I would have called the sergeant in arms and say, put this, put, arrest this man for contempt of Congress right on the spot. But it didn't happen. That, sh that kind of shows you who's really running the show. And that's the central bankers and the Wall Street crowd. And it's, and it's not anybody we can vote for. I mean, this whole voting business is nothing but a charade. It gives you the illusion that you, you have a say in things, and you don't. And so that, that way they placate the masses, you know. And then you get people who, you know, um, feel like they, oh, I voted, and my guy, it's, he's my guy, and he's in there now. Things are going to change. I voted for Barack Obama, and he said hope and change. And, and what did you get? He got nothing but the same continuance of the same corruption and even worse. 
You know, the guy, the guy is like Hillary Clinton. He can't hardly speak for even a few minutes without spewing and a torrent of lies. Yeah, uh, but absolutely. people, thanks to the internet, people are starting to see through. They're starting to pull back that curtain and see who's really running the show. The thing about Trump is, I'm worried that he represents the one percent. And when he gets in there, is he, he really going to be able to do what he? Is he really going to be able to shake things up? I don't know. Um, but the, being part of that one percent also enables him to have the freedom to self-fund his campaign so he's not beholden to anybody and that's one of the reasons he, he can act genuine he doesn't have to put on a show because he's not owned by anybody and that's what a lot of people are finding refreshing i think without trump doing what he did with coming into the campaign coming into the presidential race and all that i just don't think that there would have been nearly as much excitement or nearly as much um liveliness to the whole situation because you would have just had um probably Cruz or Rubio you know saying what they say and then you got Hillary and Bernie saying what they say but Trump is just like jumping right in and just really uh taking the limelight and well you did you did sort of have it though with with Ron Paul when he was running because he also I mean if you look at some of the polls he was leading a lot of the polls and what happened was the neocons basically stole the primaries from him outright. They just went into a, a smoky back room and stole the things. Mm-hmm. And I was really disappointed that Ron Paul wasn't more vociferous and saying, hey, you know, you, you're shutting. I was, you know, like in Maine, he was leading in uh, some of the stronger areas. He was leading uh, by far in many of the polls there. And they shut some of the polls. Oh, it's snowing. We can't open them. I'm sorry. They have to be closed because there's an inch of snow on the ground in Maine. Come on. Or they stole, I forgot what happened in Nevada, but, uh, you know, the, basically the Carl Rove types, they got in the back room, they say, we can't have this this guy, this crazy man who wants to follow the Constitution. We can't have him, uh, you know, we can't have this upstart usurping us. We have to do something. And they basically just, they basically stole it. I mean, when they installed McCain in there, I could just see him. Nobody liked McCain. Come on. He was he was scoring like Bush was, uh, Bush is now. He's got like two or three percent at best. And suddenly, some some of the early um, primaries got rigged, and oh, here's McCain. Oh yeah, well it's McCain. Yeah, we got to. Well, it's, I'm not going to throw my vote away. I have to support McCain. And so you you might see the same thing happen with Trump. I don't know, but the difference between Trump and um, and uh, Ron Paul is Trump does he doesn't like getting pushed, and he pushes back hard. So if somebody Somebody insults him or somebody does him wrong. He doesn't forget, and he pays people back. So for if, sure, the, for if sure. the Republicans try to steal this thing from him, and they still might, then I'd be really interesting to see what happens. And what I think might happen is he's going to start up a – he's going to go to a third party. And that's what we need in this country. I've said this a long time. We need a third party. It's like I compared it to um, you know, a dairy farmer going out to milk a cow. You don't see him sitting on a on a on a stool with two legs. No, he needs at least three legs. And this country needs an, a, a viable alternative third party. And right now, we really only have one party because the Democrats and Republicans are essentially the same. So, I mean, that farmer is essentially sitting on a spike. He's got a spike up his backside. That's what we get. But sure, we need, absolutely. We need like a. I was hoping it would be the Libertarian Party, but we need a, a really. A, Let's face it, the Democrats are becoming the Socialist Party and and the Republicans are becoming more and more the Globalist Party. They're both Globalist Parties. But we need a really viable alternative than the same old, you know, Tweedle Tweedle R and Tweedle D year after year where they where they trot out their establishment candidates and they give us a choice between vanilla and French vanilla. Tweedledum, uh, the Republicans actually are having a big issue right now because they changed so many of the rules to try to fuck over Ron Paul that now we're seeing, in, for instance, Florida was made into a winner-takes-all state, and it has a huge amount of delegates. But now we see Trump, who's leading in Florida, and they're quickly trying to change things so that Rubio or Jeb or Poss, whoever the establishment alternative to Trump is, could pick up some delegates but they seem to have shot themselves in the foot because they change these rules around so often to try to manipulate the race to to prop up whoever is their guy. I, I, I didn't hear that, but that's that's a great example of what they're doing, and they did that against 
Ron Paul. I mean, they're, they're constantly moving the goalposts around and and doing it to their benefit so they can get their, you know, an, their anointed ones in there. It's going to, I think they wanted Bush at first, but Bush, nobody likes that guy. I mean, so I think they switched allegiances more or less to uh, Rubio. Now, Cruz especially is with, especially with, uh, I don't think Cruz is, you know what, I, I, from what I've, some of the stuff that he said, though, I mean, I don't know if I really trust the guy. He is, he is a lot more of a true conservative than a lot of people in the Republican party. But on the other hand, I sure didn't, I didn't like what, what happened and what I saw in Iowa. That's for sure. I don't like how he started thumping that Bible extra hard for in Iowa. I mean, what kind of show is he going to put on for the other States? It's kind of like Hillary Clinton when she went down to Kentucky, all of a sudden she talks like this and she is just a good old, you know what I mean? She started yeah. speaking the Southern voice. I said, Hey, what, you don't think we're going to notice that, but she didn't. <laughs> I don't. I'm hoping that maybe Cruz is a little different than that, but I, you know, I didn't like what I saw in in Iowa. Yeah, he's definitely done some good things, but you know, uh, people have said, well, it's the campaign trail. You got to play a little bit dirty. Well, I really don't uh, agree with with. We we need somebody right now. We need is somebody that's not gonna pull tricks. Somebody that's not gonna play dirty, somebody who's going to stick true to the American values, somebody who's going to stick true and uphold our rights. That's what we need. Yeah, we needed a Ron Paul. Oh, boy. I I wish he could just uh, find the fountain of youth and just jump back 20 years so we can run again. Yeah, and I supported I supported Ran, and I was really sorry to see he didn't do very well. And I, uh, I think Ran's mistake was he tried to become – he, he kind of kowtowed a little bit too much to the Republican establishment. And mm-hmm. uh, he did some, he did some really terrible things such as um, supporting Romney over his own dad. And I saw that. I said, Oh, come on. I mean, how could you, su- you throw your support to Romney over your own father? I mean, that doesn't make a sense. And then he's also, he likes GMO foods. And where is this coming from? You know, GMO foods, really? But, you know, you can't get anybody that's perfectly in alignment with your views. And and, and unfortunately, a lot of people on the al- alternative media, and you may have discovered this already. I mean, I found out if, 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 you don't, if you don't adhere exactly and you're not in alignment exactly with everybody else's views, those other people are going to drop you. They go, oh, well, you, you don't like this. Oh, I don't like you anymore. I know. It's, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. And so it becomes almost like in the alternative media, and there's a lot of infighting and people, you know, fighting amongst ourselves with this. It almost becomes like this atomization or granularization where we're all like fighting about, well, you know, you, you want – you want this and I disagree. And I've, I've had this with the libertarians. I disagree with a lot of libertarians who want open borders. And he said, let them all in and we'll let the markets figure it out. And I say, well, wait a minute. Does that really make sense? Do we, it's, it's, it's no longer a free market anyway. We've got a crony capitalist market. And are we going to let in all everybody in the world that wants to come here? What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> is that such a hot idea? But just for me questioning it, a lot of libertarians are a little peeved that I would take that stance. If we can all rally around a common point, which is the Constitution, and want us to, you know, start getting back to to, to um, having everybody everybody follow that law, I think we'd be a lot better off. Because right now, it's by and large, it's getting ignored. Rand Paul was supposed to be this, you know, with his libertarian leanings, he was supposed to be a dash of libertarian. But uh, to swoop into the middle to kind of grasp the, that conservative establishment. However, he just alienated both sides because he wasn't libertarian enough for the libertarians. Exactly. He wasn't mm-hmm. established enough, even close for the establishment. And it just it's the luke it's the lukewarm effect. Nobody likes anything that's lukewarm for the, their side. I still I still liked him, even though he had a lot more flaws than his dad. But I, I'm sorry he had to he dropped out. You know, and then what does that leave us? I mean, we got libertarian. I mean, we got Gary Johnson, and um, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not really all that enamored with him. But um, I agree, I agree with him on a lot of his points. I mean, um, we've had people like Chuck Baldwin, and I you know I like Chuck Baldwin a lot, even though I I didn't like the uh, excess religiosity. But see, you can overlook those kind of things, and you, you still support these because they're closer. They're closer in alignment with your views than say, a Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. I mean, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I voted for Johnson, so 
I would I would probably although depending on obviously how things are unfolding there's still it's still very uh, have a little bit of time yet to see like with Trump where he's going and see how but I mean you know I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to voting for Johnson again you know in a I'm going to do a couple. I'll probably end up doing a couple cartoons that support Johnson in one way or another, because he is he is in alignment with most of my views. Uh, I I wish he was a little bit more. Somehow, I don't know what it was. He he. I don't I don't think he's um not voluble enough. He's not out there enough. You don't. I, I you heard about him yet? I mean, he just I, he just he needs to get out there and start you know, capturing the uh, attention of more people. Yeah, and with his buzz online, uh, the last election, you know, he had more buzz online. Now I haven't seen much of him, as, as, at least as much as I did in the previous election. And actually, to be completely honest with you, I hadn't even been aware that he was <laughs> running again until quite recently when I happened to check into that. So uh, oh, I, I think I thought he was. <laughs> See, you, if that's yeah. my point, though. You didn't even know. So, I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> it's time to wake yeah. up. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I know we were talking before about how the mainstream media is really kind of losing its grip as far as the more free media online goes. Uh, what some what are some of your personal kind of uh, regular news sources online that you like to look at and browse? Well, I kind of go to the Drudge Report first because it, that that guy collects all the headlines, and that's uh-huh. what that's all he really is a headline collector. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's uh, I I look at that and, um, you know, I, I go to the, the sites, the usual sites that you can you can imagine, like a Zero Hedge and a Breitbart. Right. I have a whole list that I sort of go through down the line. Now, I used to I probably shouldn't bring this up, but I used to I used to um, read a lot of uh, Infowars stuff. And I, I was really disappointed in Alex Jones this year. And I. I accidentally I, I actually published a blog about it, and I probably shouldn't have, but I was mad because uh-huh. I listened to him for several years, and I remember him distinctly saying that he was not a millionaire, and he was like, I got the impression he was funneling a lot of his money back into his operations. Of course, he has the divorce, and you find out, well, yeah, he's he's a multimillionaire, and he's got um, mansions, and you know, uh, he's he's. Um, yeah. In other words, I, I had I had an epiphany, and a lot of people say you will get this epiphany if you listen to the man long enough, and that's it. That he's really more of an entertainer, and um, I saw some videos where he um, disrupted a, an Austin gun rights rally, and I saw that. What is he doing? These people are trying to speak out, and he's he shows up in his bullhorn to disrupt it. And I said, well, this is not this is not smelling right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I took the blog down because, you know, at least he's still doing something to help people wake up, I guess. And um, it, it's like what I said, we shouldn't have a lot of alternative media fighting amongst each other. But um, I, I don't listen to him very much anymore. I don't li- you know, you see he's everywhere, though. He's ubiquitous. If you look on YouTube and his stuff is everywhere. But mm-hmm. there's got to be a lot more voices than him. I mean, he I think he has the thing where he's like the leader and he wants to have control over the alternative media. And he shouldn't have. There should be a lot more voices like yours, for example. And we can all do something. We can all get out there and do something to, um, you know, uh, ra- raise the awareness and, and say, no, this is not OK. It's it's not OK for, um, you know, the Federal Reserve to and the Federal Reserve central bankers to steal our trillions and then give it away to their cronies. It's not OK. Hey, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You can say, "Oh, well, that's just the way it is," and that's that's one of the things I mentioned. I kicked off my my book, which you know I didn't sell very many copies, but my book I kicked it off saying that, you know, I had a talk with this with my my dad years ago before he died, and he he just kind of grumpily told me, "Oh, you can't fight city hall," and that really bothered me because I said, "You know, we should be doing that. That's what we we should be fighting the city hall. We should be fighting the global hall." Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And wow. even if even if it doesn't seem like it, you're making do it's not effectual. I mean, you know, what I'm doing is, you know, I'll, you know probably it's, it it really hasn't, um, you know, made. I, it's let me put it this way: when I started doing them, I pictured myself as just all I'm going to do is throw this little rock into this little pond, and if I could just make a few little ripples to wake a few people up, then that's worthwhile. And I didn't realize when I threw this little rock in that little pond that this big giant muddy wave would come at me and <laughs> it drench me. <laughs> That's what happened. 
But everybody can yeah. do something. And that's what my book, I'm trying to encourage everybody to be a muckraker, you know, not just on the national level or the world level, but just at the local level. Try to end the corruption that you see with the police departments and the mayor's office and uh, all the graft that occurs there. Because every time you get power and money, it, the corruption is just a step behind it. It's inevitable that it, it, human nature, people are going to be corrupted. So the citizens have to be uh, um, have have to realize that they have some. They can do something. You know, everybody can do something. Can that book still be ordered by anyone in the audience? Here's what happened to me. I wrote I wrote the book on advice of a lawyer because I was so um, my, my reputation was so ruined that when you typed in Ben Garrison, all you would see is Nazi stuff. And they took everyone, all the trolls took all my cartoons and they defaced them into this horrible racism and uh, Nazi anti-Semitic stuff. And I, I didn't know what to do. I was going to stop doing the cartoons. And I talked, I talked to several lawyers. The third one says, all you can do, because the one thing I learned, you can't, you can't libel cases, Internet libel cases are nearly impossible. So she said, all, I, all you can do is go on your own PR campaign and try to reclaim your reputation that way. And she suggested I write a book. So I did. And I couldn't get any literary agents um, interested in it. And I'm, and I'm not much of a writer, I'll admit that. But I, I put together a modest book with, with color cartoons in it because I didn't want to put black and white cartoons. But color is a lot more expensive. So the bottom line, I had to, I had to spend a lot of money just to self-publish it. And um, this plate, this outfit I went for, went through says uh, they wouldn't print it on demand for less than uh, like $35 a copy. And I said, that's ridiculous. You know, this thing is not very big. It's a thin book. He, they said, well, it's, it's in color and, you know, it's very expensive for us to do. <clears throat> so I said, okay, $35. And well, how much royalty do you want? Well, I guess a dollar. So the book went out like about $36 and I make like a dollar a copy. And it didn't sell very well, but then I, I changed to, changed it around to, um, or I reformatted it into a, um, ebook and that sold a little bit better. So the ebook is on Amazon and it could be ha had for a lot less, less of a price. But the book, the book wasn't all that, you know, effective. I, but it felt good. You know, it felt good for me to, to tell my side of the story. What's really helped though is getting on social media and getting on Twitter and, um, and just trying to out, drown out the trolls. And eventually it's happened. So now if you type in my name, you see a lot of legitimate things coming up. Although there is still a photo of me in a Nazi uniform. Andrew Anglin of Ohio put my face on a Nazi uniform. And that shows up first. And that's kind of off-putting to HR departments who want to hire me for my commercial art. So I'm still fighting the fight. But I think I've turned the tide and, um, you know, the, the trolling has died way down lately. So I'm hoping that's that's the end of that. Yeah, definitely. And I can kind of relate, not to quite the extent that you've had to face, because I've, you know, uh, probably four years now that I've regularly uh, viewed your drawings, and it was right about that time that I started viewing them. Probably it was more than a couple months after that I began began to see some of those defaced versions. But I had my own little spiff trying to fight some internet libel. It was actually back in this last October. I was framed by some trolls for committing a mass shooting, and it got to the point where <laughs> I happening. was... They, they were very careful. Like I said, with you know, I, I came to find out this internet libel is a, not, almost a non-existent case. But um, they, the anchors on CNN, I believe it was, they were viewing some things, some videos I'd made, not directly naming me, not directly naming the videos, but since an online buzz had kind of formed around me and my photos and my videos that I was the suspected individual, my location had been um, put out <laughs> online because I was in Seattle at the time and the, the shooting was in Oregon. So they, they were making a little connection as far as that goes. And so um, we should team up, you and me. Go out there and make some havoc. You know, the same thing happened to me. It's they, they got they were so happy they got Fox News to um, say my name on the air and tell the country that I was a an anti Semitic cartoonist and they that was like a big victory for them. But um, at that point I was almost like a point where I stopped caring. I mean I, after a while you just become callous to it. I mean, I, I still get people setting up these fake Twitter accounts using my name and 
my face and then twittering out all kinds of racist nonsense. And I usually just sit back and let them ripen until they get enough followers. And then I'll go in and, and uh, report them to Twitter. But um, it's, yeah, it's, it's say... really it's, it, this culture with these trolls. I, mean, I, I had no idea when I started drawing the cartoons, but I don't know, six years ago or so. I had no idea what was in store for me. And I didn't I admit I did not handle it well because I really thought that if somebody stole my work and changed it into some horrendous thing and, and put my name on it and not only left my name on it, but then claim it's the real one. And then they were spreading them better than I could. Now, if you think about it, I'm not, a, you know, at the time, especially, and I still don't consider myself a public figure, but I was definitely not a public figure back then. And nobody ever heard of me, but I started getting all this hate mail and, you know, people seeing that and they were actually fooled. They really, the trolls really did a good job and they spent endless man hours just altering these things and doing, you know, all over the world. And so every, I hear the common thing is, Oh, you mean he's not a, a white supremacist Nazi artist? I thought, Oh man, I was fooled. Those trolls are, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was a pretty good jape that went on for, you know, five or six years, but it's winding down now. Yeah. I, I would say, Especially coming from, you know, the chans that were often, in my experience, often a place where there was a, kind of like a trolling ground, maybe you could say, where oh. um, it would seem like a lot of times when you would put out a new image, somebody would post it on, let's say, like 4chan. Yeah. And after a bit of time, somebody would pop up and make a comment Okay, now where's the original? And then, you know, I'll give it 30 minutes. Somebody posts something to face to yeah. all hell of with the most, you know, whatever they could come up with that was the most radical, racist thing they could think of. And they, oh, here's the original now. And then everybody goes, okay, here it is, everybody. Let's start spreading the troll machine, you know. But yeah, it is very nice. And I think I have definitely noticed that since I do still spend quite a bit of time lurking those websites that, um, that, it's that sort of behavior has definitely ceased uh, or at least decreased very, very much. So it really has. And, and in fact, if I write another book, I want to call it Ben Garrison, the, the unedited version. You know, so I, can, <laughs> I can get, I get ben, Garrison. ben Garrison back on top. Yeah. <laughs> but the chance, yeah, the chance, especially 4chan caused me a lot of grief, but it kind of, you know, it came to a head like about a year or so ago when, I was. I realized that I'm not handling this right. I'm trying to uh, get them to stop, and it just that is so. That's such a, a really dumb approach. And so I got on 8chan one one night, and I just, you know, I'm the real Ben Garrison. You just ask me the real question. I expected the trolls to like, you know, really do a number on me, and, but instead I found out I had a lot of fans there. I was like shocked. A lot of these young people like me there, and so I realized, yeah, you know what. This I, I really got to change my attitude because I was like I was like overdosing on so much anger and it's not good for you. <laughs> I realized I, 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 they're not going to change. I'm the one that has to change, so I changed. And I, I still harbor a grudge. Um, you know, I kind of like the uh, the um, the guy at uh, 8chan, the um, Hot Wheels, the Frederick Brennan. Yeah, he was actually was kind of cool because I in my book I I let him have it. And I, I drew him as a floating head in a wheelchair and his wheelchair is burning because the guy has some um, brittle bone disease and he's confined to a wheelchair for the most part. And so I, I drew him in his own personal hell. He's like in burning in this wheelchair and he doesn't, his body is, is the, the guy had a terrible luck of draw on genetics. So this poor guy, he doesn't have much of a body. So I just didn't put a body on him at all. I just had this, all he is is this intellect. He's floating in this chair burning but he has kind of a weird smile on his face. Like, it, you know, he's he's kind of overcome it himself. Well, it turns out that he liked that drawing so much that we put it on a mug. And he said, put it on a coffee mug. I said, okay, we'll put it on a coffee mug and I'll split the profits with you. And and we sold a good many of mugs. And I split, I split you, know, you know, a few hundred bucks with him on that. And I realized that, you know what, I, I, I gave it back to him with both barrels and this guy could take it, you know. And so... I thought he was cool after that, but Christopher Poole, I, I still have a grudge against that guy because he even came out and said that 4chan is <clears throat> it's not uh, anything goes free speech for him. You know, he has to say what's going to go on there. It's his, it's his uh, ballywick, and that's his right. To, it's just like Facebook. You know, you, it, 
they, they don't, they're not obligated to uh, have a bunch of, uh, you know, um, hate speech on their – they can take that down. That's not a violation of free speech. They own it. It's their thing. But in the case of Moot, he pretends it's a free speech open forum, but he's selective about what he takes down. Now, for example, he started removing all the um, – Oh, what's her name? The um, Zoe uh, Jennifer Quinn and Gamergate. And then the Gamergate. He shut that down. Now, but he noticed he didn't shut down any of the Ben Garrison threads. And I tried. I mean, I wrote to his moderators many times, and finally they, they said, stop bothering us. You have to go to mute directly. So you, ta- you ask him, and if he says it's okay, we'll cancel these threads. And so I wrote mute, and, of course, the, the little pencil neck ignored me. Um, so that just shows you he was he is complicit and he could have been sued for that if I could have found if I had deep enough pockets or I could have found a lawyer who's interested. But they weren't interested because the guy was perpetually broke. See, it's all about money when it comes to justice. If you don't have money, you can forget justice. But I still harbor a grudge against him. He sold it to some guy in Japan now. And um, I don't know what's going on. I don't check it as much as I used to. But um, I imagine not much has changed. No, there's definitely a lot less on the site. And uh, Hiryu, Hiryuki, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, yeah, I believe he's it's Hiryuki. Very, he, he doesn't seem to interact with the site very often, at least uh, overtly. But uh, it's interesting to see, what do you personally think the motivation behind someone like Andrew is in uh, The Daily Stormer? I already said, well, in my book, I kind of, and, I, and on, my, on, my, on my blog, too, I kind of um, summed up my, he's a troll. Plain and simple, he's a troll. That's And he loves trolling, and he said it himself. His, his main goal is to have fun trolling. Now, <clears throat> look at his father, who's, who's a so-called Christian counselor, and his father has money and owns some kind of a, um, office, office building in uh, Worthington, Ohio. And um, his father is the one who funded the site. So if you if you look at the source of who started the site, it's it's uh, his father, Greg Anlin. And I think I think his fa- now I'm just speaking out of conjecture at my point of this, but I think what happened was Andrew Anglin was his troublesome kid. He had two he has two other kids, and I checked them out on Facebook for for all you know intents and purposes. They look perfectly normal, healthy happy kids and, you know, no, not a, not a, any kind of suggestion or any um, hint that they might be some kind of racist nut jobs or anything. They just look like normal kids. Anglin, however, is his problem kid and got in some, got in some, um, you know, um, I think he was jailed for drugs of one sort or another. And so what does his father do? Well, what does my son like to do in life? Well, he likes to get on the internet and troll. So why don't I just fund his site and let him see if he can, maybe he'll, he'll start out with this Nazi nonsense and then he'll, maybe he'll eventually hone his way into being a respected journalist or, or even a marginally respected one. So I think his father helped him out. He started this site and, um, what it's what it's the sites is about is at least when it started off i haven't checked it in a long time <clears throat> he liked he liked to he liked to attack people um he would have a target du jour whether it be um i don't know alex jones for example he, he hates alex jones <clears throat> but he would get his troll army so he would like he, he imagined he had this power of troll army and that's what he called it to go after people and harass people and he would sit back and laugh and get donations because um, the kind of, um, you know, the um, virulent hate that he was pushing is uh, is profitable. A lot, there's a lot of people that got a lot of hate in their hearts, and they see Andrew Anglin uh, voicing that hate, and so they sent him some money. So he's become successful. And that's why I always show up first in a Nazi uniform because his site gets a lot of traffic. And since his site gets the most traffic, Google interpolates that in some way or another and there and voila there i am in a nazi uniform to start off and i've had so many com- uncomfortable conversations with um, clients like um i had one with a uh, with a guy um who really liked my work really liked me but he you know he sees me in a nazi uniform and i have to explain that and i tell you it's extremely uncomfortable to have to no say no i'm not a nazi that was the work of trolls and then i have to explain the whole saga to him and some of them understand, thankfully. So I have been getting some work in. But um, anyway, back to Anglin. He's a troll. That's all he is. But he, he does have some writing talent, and the guy's not stupid. I mean, um, he writes better than I do. 
And um, it's just too bad he chooses to um, go in that direction. I have a feeling he doesn't have doesn't believe that Nazi ideology, that cartoon Nazi nonsense that he pushes at all. He just he just does it because it's scary. You know, so he has it's part of his troll persona. I mean, he's got the skin head. He's got the, you know, the tough look and the cigarette hanging out of his out of his lips. You know, it's it's all an act. I, I don't know if you saw the cartoon I drew. I drew him in the uh, Philippines with his uh, jailbait girlfriend. I'm not saying that he said that because he had a video that he released with his jailbait girlfriend strolling through the mall. And he regretted it later and did his damnedest to um, this is the guy who can always you know, cries crocodile tears if somebody attacks his free speech. Well, this video, he did his best to stamp out that free speech. Anybody who put that up there, you know, he he got lawyers or whatever. I don't know how he did it, but he he would always get them removed. So it's hard to find the video. I think it's still floating around there. Uh, I saved it to my desktop so I could look at it sometimes. (laughs) What a twerp this guy is. But he's he's just a charlatan, you know. It, and even if he is legitimate, which I think he's not, he really is nothing but a, a social justice warrior of the far right. And that's what he does. And he calls people names and, you know, and he he does the same things that the social justice warriors of the left do. So he, I would call him a social justice warrior of the right at best. But in actuality, I think he's just a troll. Now, I guess the, uh, the, the big part of this is the way they made you into a, you know, a, Ben, uh, empty my nine on the welfare line garrison was, (laughs) do you see any sort of, uh, to me, I, I see this caricature and I think a lot of, a lot of it is they need, yeah, the Zyklon Ben, that's the doppelganger. They needed some sort of a figure, a public figure, even if he was fake to kind of, uh, push all these emotions, which I do think are, are absolutely legitimate and brewing. And it is cathartic to have somebody like that to, you know, uh, a, kind of a mythical figure who's on the run from the FBI and, you know, voicing their frustrations. I, I get that. I became their herald of hate, you know, <laughs> and, so, and, 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 and actually looking back on it, I can see how easy I would fall into that niche because here, here I am, some guy in Montana when you think of Montana, you think of oh, all those white people there, white supremacists there. Oh, my gosh. Or they think. And then I made it worse by wearing a Stetson. But the reason I got the hat is a, is a couple reasons. And, and and these guys call my hat um, a symbol of hate. Now, how could a hat be a symbol of hate, for goodness sakes? But I, I wear it for a couple. We're, we're at 3,000 feet here, and the sun really beats down a lot. And, um, you know, it's a hat like that has a lot of really good um, functions that prevent skin cancer for one thing helps prevent it. And, um, it keeps the head a lot warmer and it's just a practice. It's a practical thing. And it, to me, it looks good. I mean, I wish all men could start wearing hat. I, I was, uh, my wife and I went out to lunch today and we're sitting there at the bar having a sandwich or something and having a beer. And there's an old guy came in with a cap and this guy looked pretty distinguished, but he's wearing a baseball cap. And I said, and look, I almost thought like tell him, look, man, at your age, wear a real hat. A cap is not a real hat. You know, I had I wore caps for years, and finally I got fed up with it. I put on a real hat, and it was like, yeah, this is it. I'm not. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I'm going to wear this hat. And see, that's back in the 30s and 40s, men all wore hats. And I wish we'd go back to those days. So we, you know, instead of baseball caps like children wear, I mean, I want to wear real hats. But I digress. I don't know what we we're talking about. I'm sorry. Well, I think that the Stetson is definitely a hat with a lot of badass yeah, in it. Yeah. Still, you, they're not going to be a, like obviously fedoras is a an example of one that was that's kind of fallen from grace. You can buy those <laughs> at the mall now with rainbows and ponies and shit on it or whatever. You know, it's just um, you know the Stetson is still a very uh, really nice hat uh, in my opinion. So yeah, I agree. Well, I kind of fell into it. This uh, this I can see how how it would be easy for for this doppelganger to get created. And plus I'm a tall guy, you know, I'm, I'm like six, three and I weigh like, you know, two thirty. I'm actually too heavy. I need to lose weight. But so I'm kind of a, I'm not a, I'm not a, what they call a manlet. I'm kind of a big guy. I, I just kind of fit the bill in many ways. And then I, I draw cartoons that are, are, aren't exactly um, left of center. Right. So I kind of like this real, and then, and then, but the biggest thing of all is I was unknown. So it's really easy to take somebody like that, and I ha- I, I left a trail of like um, photos on Facebook and whatever, 
<laughs> and anybody who puts pictures on there, have to, I'm telling you, if you put any kind of photos and all of a sudden you become a target, all that's fair game, and they're going to use that against you any way they can. So anybody who leaves a trail of stuff, family pictures, et cetera, et cetera, that's all going to be used as a cannon fodder against you if should something like whatever happened to me happen to you. So I just want to warn right. people listening, be careful. I was not careful. You know, I was naive, and then this is what happened. This is the result. And I was especially naive thinking I, I had means of justice. You're not going to get any justice unless you have – really deep pockets and the chances are when you do finally and i did hire a, um, a cyber investigator and he found um uh, he found um, a couple of them but one that he didn't find that he went on a cold trail it was in and the trail went cold in australia and he thought this guy was from australia it was joshua goldberg in florida who pretended to be in australia pretended to be an australian and Joshua Goldberg, of course, you probably heard he got arrested by the FBI for sending w real workable bomb instructions to what he thought was a Muslim terrorist, encouraging this terrorist to go blow up a fireman's event for 9-11 someplace in, in Oklahoma. And, of course, um, Joshua Goldberg turned out to be the classic neat. No, no uh -huh. education, no employment or training. And nobody even knew he was still at his parents' house. He was, I guess, you know, he was one of these classic basement dwellers. Bad hygiene, long hair, neck beard, the whole works. And, and that's quite the, the quite the spectacle. And that was the guy who was one of the, my main attackers, European eighty eight, and he would write hate screed boxes of the most the most, you know, um, just disgusting stuff. Like, you know, I wanted to kill Jewish children. Well, just this this horrible junk that would that was showing up everywhere. And that was him, this twenty year old neat. Well, of course, now you know he's 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 um, trying to get off by uh, claiming uh, mental illness because he was depressed and on on de antidepressants and whatever. But he he fit the bill. I mean, I, I, it's funny in my book. I, I I got it wrong in my book, but I I had a chapter about that about the neats and their a general description of um, you know how they're 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 social outcasts. They're unhappy. They tend to be depressed. They're not attractive people. They they don't have any friends. They don't have a girlfriend. They, you know, and so they kind of like, but they do have a means to take it out on everybody. And so I, I was one of the guys he took it out on. And it wasn't because he didn't like my ideology. It was just, um, I just happened to be a convenient target that he could, you know, somebody malleable that he could change into this, uh, this voice, this doppelganger that spews out this, um, this horrific stuff that scares people. And so that was, I, I just happened to happen to be there as in, you know, and he was one of these kids that he doesn't believe anything really left or right. He just liked to pitch. He, he liked to see the red ant against the black ant and watch him fight. Mm -hmm. You see, the thing is too, is that um, when I, when I seen that he was arrested, it reminded me of a screen cap that I had seen some time back where it was actually pertaining to you pertaining to the original defamation of some of your work and uh, what I had read in this screen cap, which was a, a post that somebody had made that you know, I've been had taken a screenshot of. They said the, that they were behind the original defamation of your work because you know, yeah. they, they marketed it to these people who would, be, who would align with those views that, you know, that the defamed work would um, carry. But the, res the reason they originally did defame the work was because that they disagreed with your views and wanted to kind of spin it like this crazy stuff. So I wonder if that, you know, it makes you wonder if that was Joshua Goldberg that maybe had made that post. Well, it, it might have been it, it, because he was also harassing, uh, you know, when we started our GER graphics page, my wife and I, um, on Facebook many years ago. He, um, he was attacking us as we finally blocked him. His name was. Um, Moon Metropolis, and um, that was one of the many aliases that he had. He had like a dozen of them, and uh, he, he was a smart guy. I mean, he even trolled Andrew Anglin, the master troll, because he was writing under um, uh, articles, hate screed articles for um, the Daily Stormer, and he fooled Andrew Anglin, thinking he was some white supremacist named Michael Michael Slayer or Michael Mike Slay, or I forgot the guy's name, but he, he was going under a pen name, and I kind of I kind of got a kick out of that more than anything else to see the uh, you know the the troll get trolled, but this this kid you know I I don't um, 
I'm not anti-Semitic. I mean, I knew, I've known so many fine Jewish people in my life. They're not sitting back and trying to figure out how they're going to conquer the world and, you know, enslave the goys and whatever. <laughs> it's, just, it's just ridiculous. I mean, sure, there are a lot of Jewish people in banking. And that's because back in the Middle Ages, Jews were out, were, weren't allowed to go into a lot of trades. They were blocked and, and, and shut out. And so since usury was against, uh, for example, against Muslim and um, Christian ideals, uh, the Jews sort of fit that and became the bankers. And that's how it got started. And so that it's kind of been handed down generation to generation. Now, I think we should, if we're going to get mad and hate somebody, we should do it because of what they're doing and their deeds, not because of their race or religion. And that's always been my stance. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm, I'm never going to pin an anti Semitic crime. Heck, you know, when I lived in Seattle, you know, we were, I was friends with uh, Steve Greenberg, the cartoonist, and he was, he's, he pens a lot of far left cartoons. Mm-hmm. But we used to go and have play poker at his uh, at his place, you know, every other couple of weeks, and I just can't imagine, you know, him being some sort of like he's he, you know, he's behind the scenes trying to, you know, thwart us in any way. I mean, I just can't. It's, come on. Well, the that's guy, actually very interesting you said because I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, Steve Greenberg was also a target of his cartoons being defamed at one point. I've seen I've seen that happen, but I think Steve Steve was um, shoot he's he's been drawing him for like twenty years, mm-hmm. and I've never seen anybody as dogged and determined to be a cartoonist. That guy that guy is devoted to his craft, and I, and you know he does have a lot of talent. And he's got a great sense of humor. He's funnier in person. You know he's got a really great off the cuff sense of humor. I think he handled it probably better. The trolling I'm not sure what's going on with him lately, but. He probably handled it a lot better than me because he probably ignored it altogether like a duck's back. I couldn't ignore it, however, because – well, let me put it this way. I did, I did ignore it for two years, and guess what? It just kept getting worse. And so I would start getting people writing me, you know, do you know that this is on Facebook? And I went – I finally – I would delete them. I wouldn't even look. Oh, it's probably a troll. I'm not going to look at them. I finally went to Facebook to see what the squawk was about, and here was my face, and every single one of my cartoons was in on this page defaced. And here I am saying with my face and my name, and it says the official Ben Garrison site, and I want to kill people. I want to kill the Jews, and it's time to murder the blacks, and et cetera, et cetera, race war, blah, blah, blah. And it had like, I don't know, like four or 5,000 followers, and I said, God, and this is all showing up on Google searches. And I said, this is the, the source of it. And so that's when I went to a lawyer, my the first lawyer, and found out I couldn't sue Facebook, I, you know, because they got ironclad disclaimers, and right. you'd have to go into the individual. But to do it, you would have to go through Facebook to find the IP address, and you need all kinds of subpoenas, and you have to, it's so much red tape. It's so easy for the trolls. It's so hard for the person trying to track down the troll. But it. In the at the end of the day, it, well, at the end of the week, it took me a week to get the darn thing down. I complained to, to Facebook, and they sent back a message saying, "No, this does not violate our standards." And I said, well, "How?" In the, I thought to myself, <laughs> "Does this not violate your standards?" You know, it's like even if it wasn't you, you being misrepresented by this page. I mean, just to have these certain images with I, these certain messages out there, you know. Well, yeah, you're showing like you know African Americans hung from ropes, and you're showing a. Uh, the Jews, uh, I mean, it's just, I'm not even going to describe what it is. It's just, if it doesn't violate community standards, I mean, then your community standards are being ignored by yourself, and Zuckerberg needs to be yeah. sued for this. I mean, it was it was not just a blatant libel um, against myself, which it was. It was, it was uh, everything that, that they, it went 180 degrees away from their own damn community standards. Are you going to follow them or not? Well, it turns out that he's really not. I mean, he's got like a thing set up where it's computers that read the complaints and you have to reach a threshold before you even get to a human. And then when you do get to human, he's hired some people. I don't know. I think there's some a group in Morocco or something probably getting minimum wage. And, you know, and so, yeah, they're not going to take down an anti-Semitic page or they're probably Muslims. <laughs> I don't right. know. I'm, I'm just I'm just guessing. But. I never had so much frustration as in 2014 where I had to take down 10 of these pages and each time I had to fill out forms and paperwork and it's just – and so finally, uh, I just given up on it now. Anybody can do whatever they want. I'm not, I don't care anymore. You know, I mean, it's just like you come to a point where 
I can spend the rest of my life trying to stop this. And it's like trying to sweep out the tide with a broom. I'm not doing it anymore. So I, I kind of, I kind of like put the end to it. And I think now that the trolls realize it doesn't piss me off, they've really toned it back. At least I yeah, hope that's they, good. Yeah, that's going to be the new uh, trend now. And oh, it really, I tell you what really got the trolls mad though, because I remember reading several times saying, Oh, that, that Ben Garrison is a dumbass Cause he, he does, he could make money. He we're making him. He's, he could sell stuff, and he's not making any money on it. And I said, okay, well, I'll make some money on it. So I started, um, you know, a Patreon account to mm-hmm. try to make some, get some support. And um, I started selling my original cartoons. I start, I'm start, I'm selling prints. Mm-hmm. Oh, that damn Ben Garrison! He's he's just he's just grubbing for shekels now. He's monetizing <laughs> it. Oh, he's a hypocrite. Oh, let's don't do him anymore. And so that 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 ironically, that's the way that the, the, the trolling has died down because they don't want to support anybody. They don't want anybody to get money from what they're doing. See, it's only like destroy. They want to destroy you and and ruin you. If they see you're making money off of their trolling, and other people have done this, like um, oh, like um, um, Mike Cernovich, for example, has has mm-hmm. got a lot of notoriety, and he wrote a book called The Gorilla Mindset. <clears throat> that's done really well. So a lot of these people, they they say, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> I'll just turn it into money. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that will be me because, yeah, it's, uh, that was really what kind of got me got me a little bit of buzz was people taking shots at me for, well, the way I look was really what started it with me calling me Eggman and having a big old egg head. But now I have, you know, a lot of, People who are I talk to all, a lot online, and I have really good relationships with a lot of people. Those pictures, you know, you're not a bad looking guy. I don't understand what the deal was. I don't get it. But you know, they're going to make up all kinds of stuff, and that's you know. And for and for many years, when I was drawing these, I'm not drawing them for money. So I'm not going to do this for money. You know, and I was sticking by that. Mm-hmm. And then the trolls attacked my art gallery. They, they attacked the owner of the art gallery I was in in Big Fork. And she believed it. She really believed that I was like, oh, you're not you're not a good fit for our gallery. You're going to have to leave right away. And I said, well, no, I'm a, I, you've been attacked by trolls, you know, and that's not all that is not real. And I'm not a white supremacist. And so I hate making that speech. Uh-huh. But she was so disturbed by it. I realized I had to go anyway because, you know, she was like really, really that really bothered her. So. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to make money then. If I can't make money selling, and they're trying to go after my career, so I'm just going to turn this around, and I'm going to try to make money from my cartoons. And uh, then I also read a book, and you might have read it. It's um, it's by uh, Vox Day, and um, mm-hmm. it's called SJW is Always Lie. And I really didn't know what an SJW was for many years because I thought it was something positive. But I read that mm-hmm. book, and it really opened up my eyes to what's going on, and I said, that's exactly what's going on. And all of a sudden it's, I had in like a, almost like an awakening or an epiphany. And, um, that's when I really decided to draw cartoons that are against the SJWs. And, um, I, I drew one for, uh, Breitbart's, uh, Milo, um, Ian, Ionopoulos. I can never say his last name. Yeah. <clears throat> and that, and that brought us a lot of attention. I say us being Gur graphics cause mm-hmm. my wife helps out. Mm-hmm. So we started getting a lot of Twitter followers and it started to snowball. And um, that's, you know, I'm sure that's what you're going to be doing, too. And there's no I realize that there's nothing wrong with that to, to um, try to make. I'm, I'm telling people out there who are listening. Yeah, I'm trying to make money. I want to I want to make a living because my my commercial art business has been hurt by this. And so there's nothing, nothing shameful but trying to make money. I'm not going to get rich like some of these people do. And like, um you know, I, I, that's just not going to happen. Cartoonists don't get rich. <laughs> cartoonists are <laughs> cartoonists yeah. are about a dozen. But I'm trying. You know, I have no, I have no more, no more um, kind of like this ethics doubt about what I'm doing, making money off it. Mm. Somebody yeah, wants think, to make uh, a cartoon, I'm going to sell it. Yeah, I take a look at your Patreon, and I believe you were just shy of a hundred um, patrons, or however they call it. And I think you were saying that when you reach that, you're gonna kind of give out a, a t-shirt to the to the patrons. Yeah, I already have the t-shirt uh, ready to go, and I've already contacted a printer who will do it. Um, he's a high quality guy too, and he's he, he he actually contacted me because he likes likes my work. 
So I got it set up, but I just need to get a hundred. So um, we've kind of like stalled in the mid seventies. And um, well, maybe we will uh, go ahead and when we get this uploaded, maybe we'll go ahead and put your Patreon in the description. Hopefully, we can get you up to that hundred. Yeah, it's just Patreon. Go to Patreon and type in Gur Graphics, Gur with three R's, and we should show up. But um, so you know, I I wasn't I I didn't do anything trying to make money. I I did I turned down interviews. I had a lot of people want to interview me um, back in like 2013 and 14. I would turn them down, and finally I said after the talk to my lawyer, I said, okay, I'll just. I'm not a public speaker, but I'll, anybody who wants to talk to me, I'll talk to them. So I, I have I have had several interviews. Um, I think the biggest one was the BBC, but the first one I had was with James Tracy, and that guy. I think you might have heard that um, he was forced out of his university. Now James Tracy was the guy who questioned uh, um, Sandy Hook. You might recall. Uh huh. And uh, just because he questioned what was going on, because there was a lot of dodgy things that were happening that seemed like it was a setup, he was um, oh he was on the Bill O'Reilly show, and I think a Bill O'Reilly I, I called Bill O'Reilly the Big Leprechaun. Bill O'Reilly <laughs> was just like really angry and just really you know raking him over the coals, and I, I said, Bill is, is a this, funny guy. This is what happens if somebody questions the narrative, the official narrative. Yes, if you question it and. There's still some people today that still believe the Warren Commission nonsense with Kennedy. But see, they concoct this official narrative, and if you go against it, oh, well, you're a conspiracy nut, you're a loon, you're crazy. And that poor guy eventually got harassed out of the – he got harassed by SJWs, and he had to leave the university. And uh, and that's a shame, you know, because people have to be able to question authority and question the government and question the corrupt government's account of events, which are almost – always a bunch of lies yeah and that's something they definitely don't want in universities you to think uh think critically and rationally which is unfortunate well i hope the guy does something with his uh, podcast because he, he really has a great voice for it he has a mellifluous voice and very professional and i haven't listened to him lately i should look him up and see what he's done lately but um uh, that was the first interview i did real um and since then i've had quite a few Anybody wants to talk to me, heck, I'll talk to talk to them. Even on the left, I've had several, uh, you know, people from uh, these left uh, internet sites. But mostly, mostly what they're doing is fishing. They're just they want to find some, you know, neo Nazi nutball supports Trump. See, see, he likes. <laughs> then they find out that no, I'm not a Nazi, and a, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not even what you call a, you know, establishment conservative. Uh, Republican. I'm not a Republican. I've always voted independently. So once they kind of find out that I'm not, I'm not what they thought I was, and you know, they kind of abandon their, uh, they, they, it kind of trails off. Most of most of them don't get to the speaking part. I've just exchanged emails, and they say, okay, this is not, this is not what we're looking for. We want to find somebody like they should go to Andrew Anglin. If Andrew Anglin supports Trump, then they should go to him. See, a Nazi supports Trump. <laughs> Trump is bad. <laughs> Let's have like a the headline. The headline on Huffington Post is just uh, like a picture of Andrew Anglin's face and a picture of Trump's face with a heart in between. Nazis <laughs> love Trump. Click here to find out why. <laughs> well, you know that's that's really disappointing to me that the the low levels that journalism have sunk to. I mean, even the Washington Post they had this thing where, oh, what was it? Anonymous released um, uh, these uh, this list. It was a list of everybody who was a clan member or associated with the clan or some sort of thing. And they, and they were like, we're going to get these guys. We, we hacked the clan database or whatever it was. And here are the, you know, your local politician might be on this list. And it was, it was a big deal for a few days. It was on drudge and it was, um, uh, but the Washington post actually published an article and guess who was at the top of the list? It, me. Because the stupid trolls and anonymous, one of them, could not resist to have this uh, neo-Nazi Ben Garrison on the run from the FBI. He's a, he's part of the Klan, and he put put that put the little the little paragraph about me. And guess what? The the Washington Post here is this venerable, um, you know, newspaper won tons of Pulitzer prizes, you know, and have this long history. And what are they doing? They're publishing an article about this with, and I'm, I'm, 
I'm up close to the lead. Yeah, and, and Ben Gerson from Montana was on the list, and he was like, da, da, da. And I, that's, that's when I was like, what? They're not even going to pick up the phone. or not even going to bother to do a search. They don't even bother to do an internet search. To And I had to write the reporter, and I said, you know, what you just did is libel. You can't do something like that and not, not even check your sources. I mean, this what is your source? Anonymous. Oh, yeah, that's really reliable. Well, they retracted it right away, which I'm glad they did. They did the right thing and retracted it right away. But that shows you the low levels to which journalism has sunk. I mean, they don't, they don't do investigative journalism anymore. They just do their their narrative journalism and everything has to align with their with their political views. And that's really sad. And that's why they're going to be losing out to the Internet more and more because young people don't read newspapers, for example. I know I tried when I worked at the worked at Seattle Post Intelligence or one of my assignments was to do a weekly page to aim at teenagers. And I go out there and do um, photo shoots and, you know, and ask these kids questions. And none of them read newspapers. Do you ever read the newspaper? No. As the uniform answer was no. That's why the newspapers are dying out. They're not getting new readers and they're in magazines, too. What are the kids are all reading stuff on their phones? Mm-hmm. And so and so the, the uh, mainstream media are just terrified. They're losing their voice. And, they, you know, these propaganda arms are, arms are 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 getting amputated. <laughs> and that's good. Again, people are finding out the truth themselves and they don't have to be spoon fed this this um, all this uh, government status pap that they've been getting, that they're still getting in schools. That's all they teach them is obey government, obey government. <laughs> Constitution is bad. Founding fathers bad. <laughs> that's what they're teaching them. But on the Internet, you can find the truth. And that's what my worry is next, is they're going to clamp down. They're going to find a way to – they're, they're going to try to find a way to silence people like you and me. You know, they're going to shut down blogs. And they'll, they'll do something. It'll be a slow process, but they're, they've got it in the works. It'll be like, – um... Have you heard about the recent formation of a somewhat of a trust or security council for Twitter that's going to be made up of a certain select few individuals and they're going to start they're going to make up their little uh, rule rule guide or whatever and use that to start kind of policing people on Twitter as far as who posts what and which accounts you know the report accounts in mass and get them uh, suspended much quicker than ever before. Uh, so I feel like that's really, you know, take that's one thing right there. That's a step in that direction. And it's actually caused Twitter's stock to tumble a bit because of the negative public perception that has been surrounding that whole situation. Well, yeah. And that's one of the reasons Drudge was was really worried. He says, I might not be around next year if this goes the way they want it. And that is, he cannot be lifting up all these links and putting this on there because uh, it's not his property, so to speak. And they're going to be enforcing all these uh, these uh, uh, copyright rules. They tried to get it through with SOPA, which I opposed. And, but they're never going to end. Once they start, they never stop. It's like Hillary Clinton's I forgot what she said exactly, but something like the internet needs needs an editor. Well, of course, it's going to be people like Hillary. It's going to be these, be these, um, you know, um, these scolding commissars, and they're going to decide what free speech is and what's not. And this this is why I think hate speech is a danger because they're going to use that as a, as a, an excuse to start shutting stuff down, and they're going to like we're going to start getting if we let the SJWs take over we're going to we're going to have all these uh, these rules of speech and you can't say that i know you said this and you know and that's not the trail we want to go down so i'll do all i can to, to stop it but i don't want the i don't want the government intrusion but i think it, it's up to us as individuals to elevate the discourse i mean you'll never catch me typing in racist stuff or anti-semitic stuff or hateful stuff i'm going to elevate the discourse and have honest debates that really do change minds rather than just resorting to what to examples like we the mainstream media is doing just name calling i forgot which what was that rag you mentioned that called trump all the names uh the huffington post Huffington Post, yeah <laughs> well, and you got all those other ones i forgot what they are the daily beast and um mother uh, jones it's, it's a whole spate of them and, and a lot of them are just um 
just ad hominem attacks. That's all it is. And that's not debate. I mean, if, if you want to talk, talk to me about socialism and, and say what a, what a great thing that is, fine, let's have a debate about it. I'll bring up Venezuela. Hey, look what happened to that country. They were a net food exporter for many years, and now they're starving. So it, that's what I'd like to see, and I don't know how to solve the problem. I mean, it's like there's so many unsolvable problems in the world. I mean, I don't like abortion. I can't solve it. I don't think there should be any laws to try to stop it because they're going to get it one way or the other. You know, sometimes individuals ha have to be allowed to make their own mistakes. You know, I, I don't like what's going on, you know, with the Israel versus Palestine. I can't solve that problem, and I'm not going to draw cartoons about it. You know, I don't, I just, nothing I can, that's not going to be something that can be solved with some kind of debate. But the cartoons I draw against the Federal Reserve and the central banking system and our dysfunctional money supply, well, we can change that. I mean, we can change this, uh, this corrupt system. It's going to have to collapse sooner or later anyway. Let's get something that's more sensible. And that's why I started drawing most of my cartoons at the beginning all were more um, pointed at the economy, you know. So I did a lot of economic type stuff. Um, now I'm drawing a lot of Trumps. Why? Well, because he's fun. It's, it's a fun thing. It's fun to see the, see the establishment panicking. And, that, and the more they hate him, the more I like him. So I just yeah. keep doing Absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah. And actually, uh, Andre uh, Obler on, at the Online Hate Pre Prevention Institute, he actually is on that council of uh, Twitter censors. How was your experience with him? I did not, like I said, I did not handle it right. I wish, now, let me, let me first say this. I think he's a fine man. I think he believes he's doing the, the right thing. Um, I think he's he's sincere. He's genuine. I, don't, I, I think he really does want to, kind of tone down or, or turn down the, all the, the flaming that's going on. And, and, and I, personally, I like him. I don't, don't think it's the way to go. I, I don't like the way he went to the UN. I don't like the UN at all. And um, he, he was the only guy that helped me when I was like drowning. This guy threw me a life ring because I didn't know what to do. I was getting swamped with hate mail I was, you know, I'm getting people asking me, or do you really believe this? No, I don't. You know, it's like I was, I, I, I saw, I saw what was happening to my career. I saw I, was, I need to make a living still. I wasn't rich. <laughs> I needed to make money. And how am I going to do that if everybody thinks I'm a Nazi? And he's the only guy that, that reached out to help me out of the blue. I didn't ask. He, he wanted to help me for free. You know, he didn't, I didn't have to pay for anything. And, um, you know, it didn't work out. I mean, the thing he had me do on the thing with the 4chan was uh, draw one of these guys. <laughs> and it was, turned out it wasn't even the right guy. And, but all it did was make it worse. And um, it, 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 it kind of pushed me into a corner, too, because I don't I'm not against I'm not against hate speech, per se, or somebody's right to engage in it. I'm against hate speech. I don't like it. You know, I, I speak out against it. But if somebody wants to, to spew out their hate speech, it's their right to do it. I, I still don't think it's, it's even free because hate speech close ends debate. Let me, let me put it this way. If you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden you, you think you're going to debate with somebody and all of a sudden he says, he says I hate you and I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your, your, your wife and I'm going to kill your children. Well, how do you debate with somebody like that? Well, that's just my point. You don't debate with hate. You just it, it, it's a it's a spe free speech ender. Free speech ends right there. And what mm -hmm. they did to me was really ruin my ability to have free speech because when they started putting you know my name on all this this putrid hate, it 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 really interfered with my ability to use my own voice. So they kind of stole my name. They stole my face. They stole my voice. They stole my cartoons and created this monster. And so that really impugned my, that really kind of like ruined my ability to engage in free speech. But, it, but I, I don't think what Andre is doing is, um, is a bad thing. I, I just, I, I think it helped to help him get hate removed from Facebook is a laudable thing because it, because it goes against their own community standards. And that very first page I had that I could not remove, Andre called the vice president of Facebook and got him to take it down personally. So, you know, I, I'm not going to speak out against against Andre and I don't like I don't like the kind of the hate that he's 
battling. I mean, I don't, I don't like anti-Semitism, and I, I don't, I don't even hate Muslims. You know, I don't. I, this, this thing about the hate, and people think, oh, he's against free speech because he, he doesn't like hate. Well, you know, <laughs> if you think about it, um, aren't we better than that? I mean. Do we have to have a, an SJW hectoring and scolding us not to hate? We, we should be able to do it on our own volition, and we should be able to speak out of it. It's not something that's noble. For me to decry hate speech, it's not like I am, I am doing something um, evil there. I think I'm doing some good because that's it's not it's not something that's it's, um, it's, it's what am I what am I trying to say? It's not something that's that's radicalism and hatred and a lot of emotion guiding your decision on either side isn't going to reach any real productive solution. Well, you know, that's that's pretty much what you need to come and it debate. Just begets, it just begets more hate and it leads to murder. That's what it's exactly. boiling down to. They want people want people murdered, and that's what that's 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 the bottom line. Mm-hmm. And I don't want that. I don't want anybody to see anybody murdered. I, you know, it's from. And that's what Andre is trying to do. He's trying to kind of like, um, I don't think he's trying to censor the internet. I, if, if somebody wants to, uh, wants to hate, hey, start your own website, put your own money on it, put your own damn name on it, and then hate all you want. And guess what will happen? He won't get any traffic because hate, hate is really kind of boring. I mean, if you read this stuff, it's really dull. <laughs> So it's it, nobody's going to read it. They're not going to get any traffic. That's why they want to move it to Twitter. That's why they want to move it to Facebook. You know, they want to do that to um, to um, use you know, the existing platform to arms and get that attention. Like Andrew Anglin, it's mostly an attention device. I don't know, maybe his maybe growing up with his father, there's some kind of a weird thing there. He wants attention, so he was misbehaving to get his father's attention. And his father finally did pay attention and start a site for him here. Knock yourself out. <laughs> But I made a mistake with with the beginning with the with the hate speech thing because um, I, I was like um, I was I was really lost and didn't know what to do and so I kind of like um, did what I thought was best at the time. But I changed my mind. It was a bad thing that I tried to do was to shut down um, 4chan and try to get that stuff to stop and complaining and all that. That was the mm-hmm. worst thing I could have done. If I could go back in time, I'd change it, but, you know, I can't change it. And regret is one of those worst human emotions. I mean, if you live long enough, you get plenty of regrets, and you can't change the past. But um, but I have, but this is the way, direction I'm going now is I think it was the right one, and and, um, the, and it's it's really – the trolling is really toned down. So um, I, I think I've kind of solved that issue. Yeah, that's good to kind of be able to – work towards putting that behind you and looking to the brighter future, you know, looking to what, what can improve and kind of, you know, trying to put that episode and, and we don't uh, make mistakes. Hey, we're human. You know, that's why, that's why I took down the post of Alex Jones. The guy's human. I mean, yeah, he's probably fooling around his wife with this, these, you know, all these women that are around him. He's got the money and he's got the power and he's hanging around with, uh, Oh, who is that chucklehead out in L.A.? Um, um, the guy who just had AIDS. Uh, Joe Rogan? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. No, it's the guy. Oh, who Charlie was, Sheen. Charlie Sheen. I don't know. I forgot Charlie Sheen. But he had Charlie Sheen on his show for a while, and then we see all the orgies. I mean, come on, Alex, what are you doing? But you know, he's a, he's a human. Guy. He's a human being, and he's fallible, and he's you know he makes and, and so am I. I mean. I make a, I make a lot of mistakes, and all you can do is is, is keep um, trying to get better, you know. And I'm trying to f- focus on what I want to do, and that's uh, do the muckraking cartoons, and I'm going to continue to do them. If somebody wants to dig up on dirt on me, fine, they'll find plenty of it, I guess, but probably not as much as you would on some other people. <laughs> yeah. But you know, all you can do is is um is keep is don't give up and i almost gave up i mean i i was just about ready to give up on the cartoons altogether and um and i said no damn it i'm not i'm just going to draw them anyway to heck with it and that's the attitude you got to have and in his book vox day says pretty much the same thing you got to get to the point where you just don't care they could do what they want you know they could think what they want you can't you can't stop them <laughs> and you probably reached the same conclusion i don't know <laughs> 
Well, more or less, yeah, because I had my, I guess you could say in a similar vein, I did a couple, you know, I had some rage in me about some certain things and I, you know, went out and then people got their laughs out of that, got their kicks out of that. But now I kind of came back around. I said, you know what? I know, you know, I'm, I'm sure I have, you know, assuredness in myself to, to know what I want to do, to know how I feel, to know that I, I'm not going to let anybody's, you know, whatever they might say affect me anymore. Because, yeah, I mean, we're really, if, uh, you know, like to the point where I'm being framed for mass murder, like hours or not even hours within like a couple hours of the happening, I mean, that's pretty bad. So, I mean, really, if, you can, if they can do worse than that, I almost would say, you know, that's really impressive you know, instead of getting, getting mad, but I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't take much, um, I don't put much of myself into those kind of trolls and that sort of thing anymore. You know, I, I know what I, I know how I feel. I know what I'm trying to do. I know what I'd like to do. So I just, you know, it's kind keep of really moving just, forward. It's like, yeah. So this kind of liberating, you don't, you don't still care anymore, you know, and most people do not care. You know, I just don't think and most people don't know. A lot of people don't, even my, some of my old friends and, um, some of my family didn't know what I was going through for years. Like I wrote my uncle and I told him what was going on. And, you know, of course, this guy is in his 80s. But, he wrote, well, I talked to my nephew about this and he knows all about the Internet. And he says you should just ignore him. <laughs> 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 and I laugh because, you know, I tried to and it didn't work. But in, in, the, in the bigger global picture of the thing, yeah, I, I just get you got to ignore him. And it's. But they do they do a lot of harm. They can do a lot of harm to somebody who's not prepared for it. I mean, even um, what's her name, Zoe Quinn. I mean, um, it wasn't right that they went after you know doing harass harassing her the way they did. That just wasn't right. I mean, I I know I know they had a legitimate beef about the industry and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's that's what they do when they go all out to try to destroy you and and dox you and release your social security number and encourage people to, uh, I don't know, all these, these heinous things. I'm not talking about pizza delivery, but I'm talking about worse, you know, threats of rape and it gets pretty bad. So, but I think you and I both have been through that ring of fire and it's past us. So, you know, it was a learning experience. Exactly. Yep. So is there anything else I can uh, add? Um, I feel like we covered the bases pretty well that um, that I could think of. Um, yeah, everything I've, on the checklist seems to be checked off, actually. <laughs> uh, I guess what we need is a uh, best way to direct people to support you. Uh, the best way is through the, the Patreon site. They just go to patreon.com and type in Gur Graphics. Or they could go to my website, which is gurgraphics.com. That's G-R-R Graphics. And I chose the Gur because it's it's anger, but also and I have a couple R's in my name, Garrison. So I, I tra- called it Gur Graphics. Um, that's actually really cool. I, I, didn't, I, I connected the Gur to the anger before, but the Gur with the Garrison, that, that's that's cool. And that's why I have the bulldog. I put the bulldog in there as a logo. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's that's where they can and they can. If somebody wants to write me, they could reach me through the uh, Gur Graphics. There's a link to my email. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, it was great to have you on, Ben. Well, thank you. Maybe someday I'll have you on my show. How's that? I would love to. Okay. All right. It was nice talking to you. And it was really awesome to have Ben on the cast tonight. Um, if you enjoyed it, make sure you like, definitely subscribe, comment down below, and uh, make sure you also support Ben. He's a really hardworking guy. He makes some really nice cartoons. He's been doing this for a long time, and he can really use your support. So check him out. Check out his Patreon, and uh, if you sign up, because he's going to be sending out some free T-shirts, so that's really cool. I'm actually going to do it myself just because I really like the shirt that he's got on there. So you guys check it out, and we'll see you next time.